Oh, you just caught me waking up to the alarm feature in the PackPix Click and Stick Macro Media Program. It was allegedly released in 2004 to help hype up potential customers for the then upcoming DS title, PackPix. And let me tell you, I haven't had an oversleepful morning since. This program came in handy for an entire duality of tasks, serving as an all-in-one text editor and alarm clock. Perfect for love letters, resumes, laundry lists, and remembering to purchase pack picks when it comes out on March 10th, 2005. The alarm even makes a Pac-Man sound. Ah, the iconic Pac-Man tone, evocative of fond memories and gamers everywhere. I'll pause for a second to let you brush the single tear of nostalgia from your eye. This program is a crucial element in my daily routine, which is one reason I never upgraded from Windows XP. The OS is still tolerably functional in the modern day and age, and if you try to run the aforementioned PPC and SMP on Windows 7, it'll install but won't actually work when you open it. Deal breaker. The alarm feature does have a few quirks. For instance, it doesn't seem to go off exactly on the minute, taking several seconds before actually making the sound. But it more than makes up for that by letting you set one of your sticky notes as the alarm notification. It's all I ever wanted. However, this nifty little utility does have a single failing. The webpage it links you to to find out more about PackPix is no longer online, and it's been excluded from archive.org for some reason. So under the presidential line of succession, the burden of finding out more about PackPix falls to yours truly. Okay. Flashback to E3 2004. A simpler time, the world had only had to suffer my existence for a year or two, and Nintendo was about to unveil their all-new handheld system, now with a touchscreen. Now, you can't just give a device a frivolous gimmick like that and expect everyone to buy it. You need something solid backing it up to reel people in. Nintendo knew this, and so Reginald E came prepared and it was time to pitch the DS. The first is touchscreen, responding to either a stylus or to your fingertip. It's trans. As inevitable as the DS's success may have seemed given the positive reactions the E3 conference elicited, it did need to prove itself to show the validity of touchscreen as a viable control system. While it wasn't the first touchscreen game console, it might as well have been. Without good games taking advantage of it, the DS would have flopped like, uh, sure. And that didn't happen. On the show floor tomorrow, you'll see a wide range of demonstrations. Many of them, in fact, will become retail software. Walking this way through an uncharted sea of commodities and neo-capitalism. One of the really cool games is called Pack Fix. To take a look, Corey's playing it right here. As expected, on show is a fairly basic tech demo called Pack Fix. It was overshadowed by pretty much everything else on display, but it was there. Packpix's shtick was that you could draw Pac-Mans on the touchscreen using the stylus, and then the game would bring them to life with animation. You could then redirect them by drawing walls to try and get them to turn and eat the weird looking ghosts. Animating the player's scribbles made for a neat party trick, and most attendees who tried it responded fairly positively to the concept. However, some reviewers astutely remarked that it felt more like a tech demo than a game. It's alright, but it feels more like an apple than an orange. Packpix was clearly in its rough initial stages, not very fleshed out as a game beyond showing off the DS's capabilities, and that's all I was aiming to accomplish at this point. But how did this demo come to be? Wikipedia has answers, but I'm not one to take information from a tertiary source. I only want the cold, hard, pick packs facts. The section surrounding the game's development cites a 2005 issue of Nintendo Power, which has fortunately been digitized online. But unfortunately, a citation intrigued Amelia to be predated the scan's release by about eight months, and resorted to the archaic practice of buying physical media off the internet. Contained therein is a brief interview with producer Hideo Yoshizawa on the subject of, you guessed it, pack picks, where Tetsuya Shinoda is credited with coming up with the concept around 2001, after being intrigued by the way he could scribble out text and have it evaporate into a puff of smoke on an Apple PDA, presumably the Apple Newton. If I want to erase something from the screen, all I have to do is scrub it out, just like, boom. An arcade touchscreen Pac-Man game was prototyped, but shelved, and subsequent attempts to pitch it as a tablet or PDA game fell through due to lack of consumer interest in games on those platforms. With the arrival of the Nintendo DS, the climate seemed like it might be right for Pac-Pix to finally have its time to shine, and so a demo was made for E3, and the reception ended up being positive enough to justify making the concept into a full game at long last. All things considered, $8 for the same information in a different place wasn't that bad a deal. Words really hit different when they're on 17-year-old paper. As you'd expect, a lot of changes ended up being made to the demo shown on E3. Fairly quickly, they realized that the art style needed to be changed, demonstrated by this Japanese DS promo video that was shown off later in 2004. At this point in development, they'd redesigned the rough, sketchy, notepaper vibe in favor of a more cartoonish look. What you see here was an intermediary stage in the graphics between these ugly ones from the E3 demo and these ones seen in the game finally released. Maybe they decided that these ones were too cute and that kids would feel bad killing the ghosts if they looked scared. Eh, maybe. 
Another thing they did away with from the E3 version was the distracting amount of direct holdovers from the original Pac-Man. The grating 80s arcade sound effects were replaced with modern creations to fit the game's aesthetic, and they also removed the gameplay element where ghosts turn blue like you'd eat in a power pellet whatever you do with Pac-Man. Since there's no point where you can't eat the ghosts in pac picks, it was just a confusing homage to the original game that, while fitting for an eye-catching tech demo, was better off scrapped in the final game. We get it, you're a quarter-century-old franchise spin-off. I'm fine with it, I just don't want it shoved down my throat. So it's taking an old concept and making it fresh and new with the with the uh, touchscreen on the DS. Pac-Mix got a good bit of praise in the anticipatory reviewing world, specifically for putting a contemporary spin on the well-worn gameplay concept of Pac-Man. And to that I say, what concept? Shapes? It doesn't even have a maze or pellets. If eating things and changing direction is all it takes to constitute the Pac-Man concept, then they would have sued Nakia. Don't get me wrong, the game's ingenuitive use of the touchscreen was a fun novelty, but gameplay-wise it had virtually nothing to do with Pac-Man. Pac-Picks released in Japan on March 10th, 2005. How do they know that? Are you a big import gamer? I guess. Are you offended that two perfectly good Japanese games from this week were released to the American market first? Yeah, that's not right. Then you follow the right link. Way back in the day, this IGN article was updated live with all the new Japanese game releases as they came out. If you really wanted to play Pack Picks a month and a half early, it was an option. But even after the full game had been accessible to diehard import gamers for a couple weeks, GameSpot only got a four-level demo cartridge to try out for the preliminary coverage. So much for their purported Best Gaming Website Award. They won that the previous year at the Spike TV Video Game Awards, which was a video game awards show I couldn't believe it either that ran from 2003 until it was cancelled in 2013, at which point the producer, Jeff Kinney, chopped off a exactly a dozen letters from the name and continued the annual ceremony in a discreet, undercover fashion to this very day. The year GameSpot earned their prestigious title was 2004, and a special show hosted by The True Gamer to D -O -Double -G Snoop Dogg. Hey, he's one of us! Rockin' that Xbox controller S minus green. What a flex. You know, there's only one of those. Unfortunately, the event hasn't been uploaded in full to the internet anywhere I can find, making it the second most important piece of lost media featuring Mr. Dog, next to his collaboration with longtime E3 host Ray William Johnson. But fortunately, there are a little under an hour's worth of highlights to give us somewhere in between a taste and a full serving of how things went down. Now, our first award is for best performance by a human female. Sorry, inhuman female performers. Maybe you'll get a category next time. It was basically your standard awards show. In a traditional awards show fashion, you watch in anticipation as the nominees duke it out via hyped announcer in a variety of subjective categories, ranging throughout all facets of the gaming industry. Complete with celebrity appearances, rapist Scientologist appearances, 90s style jump cuts to announcers yelling about video games in random places, and significantly more than the recommended daily doses of product placement, interspersed with various other gaming related segments to break up the monotony. And now, hot girls read cheat codes! <laughs> It's 2004, who cares about Ninja Gaiden on the NES? This has been Hot Girls Read Cheat Codes! Oh, and that code she read literally isn't even for Ninja Gaiden like the screen said. It's for Hot Shots Golf on the PlayStation. And by the first-hand account of an IGN board's post from the time, that wasn't the only mislabeled cheat code they read during the show either. What a cruel trick. It wasn't really the game that was cheated. It was us. Hey everyone, this is Lindsay and Deanna. They're gonna be helping me present the awards all night. So that way, uh, if you don't like their winners, you at least like looking at them get their awards. Snoop Dogg, Lindsay, and Diana continue to present all the various categories for a while, but towards the end, they just stop and have a voiceover takeover. I guess they couldn't book Snoop for the full event, despite him being the only selling point on the show's promotional print advertisements. The new disembodied host proceeds to run through the rest of the categories with no additional commentary besides just saying the winners, moving right on from one to the next like they're just trying to get it over with, without even listing the nominees. So they zoom right past best fighting game, best action game, best graphics, best new technology, best handheld, and best mass multiplayer game. However, naturally they make an exception for Cyber Vixen of the Year to show the recipient's acceptance speech. So, I'm officially, officially The lack of transparency in refusing to disclose the Cyber Vixen of the Year nominees is indicative of a rigged competition. Hackpix was robbed. Before his departure, Snoop made multiple breaks in the ceremony to endorse a few specific titles he personally enjoyed, as well as to promise the upcoming release of an all-new video game starring himself, which was much like my social life in the sense that it never actually happened. Snoop Dogg lied to me? What, next you'll be telling me he's not even really a true gamer, either? Yeah, that adds up, actually. No amount of money in the world can persuade an authentic gamer to sell out for game. Ooh, one year from now, I won't be able to be fucked to buy the full Japanese version of pac picks spot. Low as they were, even the Game Awards themselves demand this kind of thing. How'd you get a PSP? 
It only came out in Japan on Sunday. They don't sell those in America yet. I told you, dude, Spike TV has all the hookups. This baby's the only one in the country. Whoa, that's crazy. Though in fairness, even if GameSpot had secured a Japanese PacPix cartridge, it wouldn't have been the same experience as the actual US release. Over in Japan, they got these cute little PacPix crayons on the cover, while everybody else just got these boring, generic highlighters. God, I hate censorship. An even more egregious instance of cultural pandering comes from within the game itself. To put things into historical perspective, I'll read you a Usenet group exchange that occurred on April 29th, 2005, just three days after the game released in North America. In a video I saw of the import version of PacPix, one could draw butts and they would fart. I picked up the US version today and can't seem to create farting butts. Do I have to beat the whole game before I can draw them in the practice room, or have they been entirely removed from the US version? They've been removed. What is the world coming to? Not this, evidently. Following its international release, PacPix ended up being one of the worst selling of all the E3 2004 DS demos that made their way to store shelves, putting up less than 300,000 copies. I guess that was to be expected considering the competition included gaming industry icons Mario, Sonic, and Yu-Gi-Oh, but hey, at least it did better than pac -Man. In the years since, the game has fallen even further into obscurity, with only a measly 25 YouTube subscribers to its name. If you're watching this, there's a decent chance you're more relevant than PacPix. What went wrong? Let's take a look at the game's market. As far as I can find, PacPix didn't get much of this at all in America, either in the form of TV commercials or print advertisements, except occasionally being included as a smaller piece of bigger ads that wasn't the main focus. However, it received considerably more advertising in Japan. Here's a Japanese poster, showing an ice skater carving Pac-Man into the ring. That's nice. The TV version of the same ad reveals what happens in the immediate aftermath. In a horrifying twist of events, the Pac-Man comes to life and tries to eat her. There was also this promotional poster from the UK, advertising the drawing feature of this cute little connect the dots activity here on the bottom. And let me say what I would give to fill that in with a marker. Significantly less than that. The closest thing PacPix got to a commercial in America was a DVD included with the August 2005 issue of Nintendo Power. The DVD was full of promo videos for recent and upcoming games, which were all mostly about what you'd expect of a game trailer, with the standard advert production like taglines, music, narration, and carefully spliced gameplay clips, perfectly engineered to make kids go, I want that. But as you got further and further into the back catalog of the DVD, the production began to falter. You have to go almost all the way to the end to even find PacPix, and the trailer is one of the most mundane showcases you could possibly put together. Literally just a few clips of the game, with no narration or editing whatsoever, and no illustration of the game's fundamental gimmick by showing someone actually drawing on the screen with a stylus. They didn't even go to the usual trouble of muting the game's background music and layering a song over the sound effects in post, so the music here cuts at every splice. Compare that to the fancy visuals and transitions that went into the advertisement on the same DVD for Yoshi's Touch and Go, another E3 2004 tech demo turned game. What you actually see in this trailer is basically the same, just snippets of gameplay footage, but the presentation makes it clear which game was the higher priority. With this in mind, it's not really all that surprising that PacPix didn't sell very well. All that really got in the way of promotion was that footnote of a gameplay trailer and an, admittedly stellar, clock slash sticky note program. I'm convinced that someone at Nintendo had it out for this game to fail. You might chalk up the former to someone quickly throwing together a simplistic edit service filler on the end of a low-budget magazine freebie, but I consider myself something of an aspiring cynic. I'm blaming them. Of course, marketing is only one side of the consumer deciding whether or not to purchase a game coin, the other being gaming journalists. Their opinions make a big difference to some people. For instance, I had a personal policy where I refused to play anything that got rated less than 45% on NetJack. Sure, I might not be able to play anything released after the site shut down in 2010, but hey, at least I have standards. PacPix received mixed reviews. It was generally received positively as a neat little thing to play around with, but negatively in terms of failing to provide a substantial gaming experience, with the $30 retail price being a bit much for a game so short and simplistic. But that's just the modern accumulated consensus from Metacritic now that history is dried and settled. To get a proper look at things, we need to go back in time, to the game reviewing battlegrounds of the mid-2000s. Archive.org has a search category where you can look for keywords in their archive of web pages from major past. Most of the time it only pulls up spam, as that's the internet's primary ingredient, but every now and then you'll come across a gem of genuine content, like packpix.rarler.info, a 2007 page which has done my job for me by accumulating all the timely game reviews in a single place. Huh, mm, the recent excursion for the funny little hero with the pizza slice. An apparently charmed and positive impression from gaming coverage frontrunner Mouth is. Packpix, a game that famously started life as a DS pre-launch. A relatively neutral takeaway from the entire tech industry. Demo. For Uni Grande Photo di Nintendo DS, PacPix DS Zoom as Sir L39 Image. Uh, I don't speak Russian. But the attribution of a prestigious news publication like Time Magazine on a random video game review makes me skeptical as to this website's legitimacy. 
Searching rarler.info only turns up six results in the modern internet scape, two of them being spam block lists, one being a list of web domain registrations, and the other three being the final remaining relics of an internet-wide spam bot campaign, outliving the site they were advertising by over a decade. Two of them are wikis, and one of them is the discussion section on a 2006 workshop on theoretical physics at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. In the decade and a half since its creation, this particular discussion thread has served as a haven for 12,396 relatively long-lived spam bot posts. However, it may not for much longer, because the LIPI is apparently being disbanded as an organization, a process which is expected to be completed by January 1st, 2022. I guess they forgot to turn the site off. It still works, too. I was even able to add my own little contribution to the 14 years dormant forum, which as far as I can find was never actually used by anything other than spam bots even on the other discussion thread. Once the plug is finally pulled on this site, tens of thousands of useless messages will meet their inevitable end, and rarler.info's dwindling legacy will be reduced to its two final spam posts on those wikis. As you'd expect, pretty much none of these inaptly formatted DB code links work anymore. Take for instance pornosmp 3 for uorg The domain no longer exists, and it was never archived, it's truly the audio equivalent to the textual loss to society that accompanied the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Hackpicks. When you turn it on for the first time, you're greeted with a storybook introduction laying down the exposition, so nobody will be left wondering, why does Pac-Man have a pen in the drawing game? Fun fact, this magic pen, as it's called, is actually real in the form of a special promotional pack pick stylus, but it was only released in Japan and it costs too much, so alas, I can't play pack picks the way God intended. It was apparently a limited bonus available to people who bought the game early, and there was a whole section dedicated to it on the game's Japanese website, complete with a lot of fun little graphics. It apparently wasn't sold in stores and was only available online as an inclusion with online orders, like on this now out of stock Amazon listing from the time. Back to the story, the most iconic video game character of all time eventually traps all the ghosts into one last book, using his considerable skill and talent, the same way I got through college. And then you get to the game itself. It's broken up into 12 levels, or chapters, given the whole book theme, and each chapter is further broken up into multiple pages, which are individual screens where you're challenged to get all the ghosts using only your limited allotment of Pac-Man to draw. They definitely expanded on the basic premise a lot between the original demo and the final release, making it more of a full-fledged game by introducing more gestures, like arrows to shoot down ghosts and bubbles at the top the screen, which is now a usable part of the playing field in a lot of stages, and bombs to explode obstacles down on the lower side, as well as more types of enemies and boss battles, which are sprinkled in throughout the course of the 12 chapters to keep it new, fresh, and engaging without the basic gimmick getting too repetitive. The final release of the game is also a major improvement over the original demo in another way, since you no longer get snarkier marks from the orange ghost, Clyde, when you lose. Or Sue, as he's called in Ms. Pac-Man for some bizarre, inexplicable reason. Hmm, that was very poor. SHUT THE FUCK UP, CLYDE! You fat- this boss is so hard to beat. If only a man who works for GameFlasma.com who just played a clearly demo of Pastics at the 2005 Game Developers Conference in San Francisco were here to explain it to me. All right, so now we got a game coming out in April from Namco. Everyone knows about Pac-Man. Right here, we got Pac-Picks. It's going to be a big ghost, so you have to draw a big Pac-Man. If you don't draw your Pac-Man big enough, well, you're not going to be able to do any damage. Thanks. The touchscreen gestures are all surprisingly accurate and consistent for such a nascent video game feature. It's like I'm really there. I rarely ran into frustrating situations where the game didn't recognize what I was trying to draw, unless I did it badly, and the end product is a charming and unique, albeit very short and simple game. So short that I spent more time looking for relevant E3 footage than I did playing it, and so simple that I can't think of anything else to say about it. Which brings us to the question I'm honor-bound to answer as a reviewer of an obviously obsolete game. Is it worth playing in the current year? Is there any reason to do anything? Help yourself, nobody's gonna stop you. Hmm. Consider my last sentence old news, because I've just been coerced into enlisting as the first member of the local Prevent People From Playing Tactics Club. I've gotta run. I'm getting reports just in that someone out there is almost done watching a YouTube video ostensibly about pack picks right now, raising the likelihood of them going on to play it to low but unacceptable levels. See you later, X!